Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm Eunsoo Gang, one of the associate pastors here at Riceville United Methodist Church. I want to welcome you to this worship service at Vine, an online campus of Riceville United Methodist Church. Whether you are eager to encounter God or wondering how God works through our lives or seeking to experience healing mercies and peace from God, once again, welcome to this worship service. As we have entered camp meeting month in August, this is a very special time for you to cultivate a deep relationship with God through special song, touching testimony, and a powerful message. As we gather under the embrace of loving Creator, may you feel God's gentle presence surrounding you. May God touch your heart during this time. Now, let us prepare our hearts before God and feel closer to the Lord. As we continue to worship God, please join me in our opening prayer. Lord of light and life, we come to you this day to worship you in celebration your love and kindness. Create in us clean hearts, O God, and renew steadfast spirits within us. Open our minds and spirits to receive your words for us that we may grow in our faith and live the new life in Christ. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. My name is Pam Zarilla. My husband, Paul, and I have been members of Wrightsville UMC for over eight years. We go to the 815 service. Because it's camp meeting month, Pastor Doug suggested I tell you about our pilgrimage on the Camino de Santiago Compostela. And so here is my story. For me, the walk on the Camino had been a distant dream, a bucket list kind of thing. Years ago, a member, Bob Moffat, shared his experience on the Camino and encouraged me to watch the movie The Way with Martin Sheen, which I did. What an adventure. You put all you need in a backpack, knowing no one, you walk 500 mountainous, backwoods, semi-residential, hiking boot miles following little yellow arrows placed on trees, posts, ancient walls, all the way from France to the Atlantic Ocean. With other people you don't know from around the world who may or may not speak English in a foreign country, and they call you a pilgrim. Sounds perfect. Hey, our own Chris Brown did it. Yeah, but he bikes 20 to 30 miles a day, hikes steep hills regularly, trains with 40-pound rice bags in his backpack for weeks before his journey. I'm not in shape for anything like that. Besides, no one I know would go with me now, not even Paul. But oh, I wanted to go. What a dream, what an adventure, right? Well, then the first Sunday, back after six weeks in Connecticut, there it was. In the Sunday Bulletin, join Wrightsville UMC Camino de Santiago de Compostela with Reverend Doug Lane. My heart pounded. Was there still room? Who was going? There was Pastor Doug, of course. He was the leader. Great. Paul, want to go? Nope. Great. So I talked to Donna to find out more. The trip was to walk the most popular portion of the Camino. 113 kilometers, around 77 miles, walking 15 plus miles a day in five days. Hmm, I think with a little work, I could do that. Are we staying in hotels? Nope. Base camp would be a luxury hotel in Lugo, Spain, where you are returned by van every day and then taken back to the Camino where you left off. Okay, 
So there were rescue opportunities, a real bed, food, and a hot shower each night. Donna began listing the names of the other people going. Do you know Sandra and Joe? Nope. Do you know Jan and Jeff? Hmm, maybe. How about Ken from our church? Oh yeah, I think I did an Altruza Bible study about seven years ago. Do you know Chris? Oh yeah, he opens our 815 doors on Sunday. And then she said, there's other people from other churches going. Oh, Janet, a pastor who used to come here. Nope. Tim, Pastor Doug's brother-in-law. Nope, don't know him. Julia, who? Oh, Pastor Julia. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then Frank, a pastor from another pastor? Whew. I'm thinking, oh boy, how much help does a person need to go on a trip like this? I would be the 12th person if I go. Hmm, before departure, I need hiking boots, Backpack, no tent. Oh yes, and then train the recommended nine miles a day before departure. Wow, international travel by myself? What if I couldn't make it? What if I failed, missed my plane, or held other people back? The others seem so much younger and in better shape. I hadn't done anything like this since before college. Doubts filled my head. I needed to think about it. I reasoned, well, it's a church group. It's adventure, right? And it was on my bucket list. Go big or go home. A week later, I told Donna, I'm in. I had trained by chunking out my time to walk three, six, or nine miles each day for two months. I packed all of my clothes and toiletries in my backpack. I had everything fit in here. I was planning on wearing my hiking boots, one of my day's wears with the idea that I could wash out my necessaries each night. I was nervous, but I was determined. A kiss and a hug from Paul, and off I went. When I met up with the group at the airport, there they were with great big bags of spinning luggage, quietly talking to each other. And there I stood with my backpack. What was I thinking? Where's your luggage, someone asked. Well, this is it. Laughter, of course. Well, whose bag is that? Well, that's Janet's. I was helping her carry your stuff. Your backpack? That's it? Nicknames began, and I was crowned one bag pam. Chris handed out his wife's scallop-shaped sugar cookies, and our group of 12 began to meld. The journey had begun. We arrived in Lugo, excited and energetic, Wayne Camino, the van took us to our starting point in Sarah and the prov in province of Galatia. The Camino begged us to leave everyday life, be present, and connect to the well-traveled path that would take us to the burial site of St. James. And we were so ready. We carried stones symbolic of our petitions of mercy, love, or guidance, and wore scallop shells with the pilgrim crest painted on it to identify with the other Camino journeymen, and we stepped off, 113 kilometers to go. We walked together, we prayed together, we ate and laughed together, we encouraged each other, we pondered and let our feet take us on a trail that reflected our lives and the lives of thousands of pilgrims who had come before us. We found our pace, we were present, and prayerfully put, one foot in front of the other. The steep hills, the rocky paths, and the various pavements were hard on our feet, our knees, and our hips, but we journeyed on, chatting, sharing with other pilgrims on the way, shouting, Buen Camino! More hills, more changing road surfaces, more boots, more huffing, and then, on the fifth day, we heard it. The bagpipe welcome as we walked through Santiago's ancient streets to reach the overwhelmingly majestic and beautiful cathedral of St. James. And there it was, zero kilometers. The grand square was filled with so many other pilgrims. The rush of feeling was overwhelming. People were crying and hugging, cheering the journey's end, taking group pictures and selfies, all of us walking, marveling, spinning, laying down on the ground to take in the full face 
of the cathedral and soak in the moment of accomplishment, overjoyed to have reached our destination. The rush of exhaustion was overcome by peace, and in knowing we did what we set out to do, we were in the lap of our Lord. For thousands of years, people like you and like me have walked their own personal journey. The end, like the walk, is personal, intimate, and holy. Thank you, God, for your mercy and guidance. Thank you, St. James, for a safe journey. Thank you, Santiago, for the generous welcome. Thank you, Wrightsville UMC, for your prayers of community. Thank you, Camino friends, for support and encouragement. And now I look to you. Where will your next journey be? What risk will you be willing to take? To all and to each of you who are called to walk your path, to carry your stone and lay it at the feet of Jesus, I wish you buen camino. My next journey will be the Pilgrim of St. Francis of Assisi in October. Paul will come this time. Where will your camino take you? Of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I'm Pastor Julia Hayes. I'm one of the associate pastors here, and it's my joy to lead us in prayer today. Will you join me now as we go before God in prayer? Holy and loving God, we have gathered together today to remember, to remember who you are, to remember who you have made us to be, to remember how you want us to live. Thank you for giving us the rhythm of weekly worship that calls us to remember. We need this because we suffer from spiritual amnesia. All too often, we forget that you haven't just made our lives a little better, a little more meaningful, a little more peaceful. No, in Christ, we have died to our old way of life and have been raised to a new life. God, help us today to live in this new pattern of life. Make compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, not just nice words, but virtues that we grow in every day. Help us to start with those closest to us, our family members, coworkers, and friends. We ask that you make this church a training ground for right relationship. Make this a safe place where all are growing in holiness, but where grace surrounds us when we mess up. God, we pray also for the wounds of the world. Where there is suffering, be present, O oh God. We pray especially for those whom we now name before you in our hearts or with our voices. God, we thank you that you hear our prayers. We ask all this with faith of your unending, overflowing, unstoppable love. And we pray in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. 
thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we transition now into a time of generosity and reflection, I'd like to remind you that you can always give to the ministries of Wrightsville United Methodist Church through the mail, our website, wrightsvilleumc.org, and our smartphone app. Let us now continue to worship the Lord our God. make it fast. Hi, Wrightsville kids. I'm Pastor Julia. And as you can see, I'm somewhere really, really cool today. I am just finished a hike all the way up to the top of a mountain. Isn't that amazing here? Well, you know, sometimes on the trail, it was really hard and it was really tiring and we had to do things that were really difficult, but a couple things made it worth it. One was that we were always together as friends. I'm here with a group from the church and we've been together the whole way. So when one of us was really struggling, the other one would help maybe give us a hand and help us through a hard spot. It was also really helpful because sometimes we saw people who were on the way down and they'd encourage us and tell us there's just a little bit more to go and the view's so amazing. And now that we've gotten here, we can see how amazing it is. You know, sometimes in life, we go through hard things. The Bible doesn't tell us that everything's gonna be easy for Christians. In fact, the Bible says that we're gonna go through hard stuff all the time. But because we have God and we have the friends that God's given us, we can get through all of those hard things. We know that Jesus said, in this world, I will have, you will have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. So even when we're doing hard things, whether it's going through something hard at school or with your friends, or if it's climbing up a mountain, you can know that God is with you. That is good news. Let's say a prayer. God, thank you that you are with us always, even when we are going through hard times. Help us to encourage others when they're going through hard times too. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. It's good to be with you today. My name is Doug Lane. I'm senior pastor here at Wrightsville United Methodist Church, and I'm excited to be able to bring today's message to you. We're finishing up. Uh, we're getting really close to the end of our sermon series on the letters of the New Testament. Um, we're back with uh, the Apostle Paul today and uh, a really important but short book in the Bible called Colossians. And we're going to pick up today in Colossians chapter 3, verse 7, if you'd like to follow along. Paul writes, These are the ways you also once followed when you were living that life. Now you must get rid of all such things, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive language from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have stripped off the old self with its practices and have clothed yourselves with the new self which is being renewed in knowledge according to the image of its creator. In that renewal, there is no longer Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free, but Christ is all and in all. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another. And if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in the one body. 
and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Teach and admonish one another in all wisdom, and with gratitude in your hearts sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, we thank you for this day and ask that you will be with us as we continue with this worship, but also that you would lead us so that we might worship you throughout this coming week in all that we say and all that we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Whenever people visit a beautiful, impressive church building, invariably there are two things they want to do. First, they want to go up to the pulpit and see how things look from this perspective. And then secondly, if there's a balcony, they want to go up there and also look down on everything. If you're in an old European cathedral, you sometimes have the chance to take it a step further because some of those churches have old bell towers you can climb up to so you can really see things. And isn't that typical? There's something inside of us that needs to climb to the top and get the view from above. When we were children, we would go climb trees, maybe even build tree houses up in the branches so we could see the world from a different point of view. When we got older, we'd climb to the top of a skyscraper and gaze out upon a vast city below. My daughter Olivia and I went to Paris last fall. What do you think the first thing was that we wanted to do? Climb to the top of the Eiffel Tower and look out on all the rest of Paris. Why do we do this? What's inside of us that makes us want a view from above? Psychologists have an answer. They say there's a sense of power that comes when we stand above the rest of the world. We can play God, look down on everything, have a feeling of omnipotence. It's kind of like the Goliath complex in all of us. You remember the big warrior of the Philistines from Old Testament times? He stood head and shoulders above everybody else, and he thought that his size made him invincible. When young David came out to meet him on the battlefield, Goliath laughed and said, look at this little puppy that's running after me. Now, as it turned out, Goliath clearly wasn't able to defend himself against someone skilled with a slingshot, but he thought he was easily superior to little David walking out on the battlefield. And that's what we all want to feel like now and then, like a person who fears nothing. But there's another reason we like the view from above, something not quite so selfish, not so arrogant. It's a sense of perspective. When you look out the window of an airplane, you begin to see how things fit together, how the hills and valleys interlock, how the fields form a mosaic, how the towns have shape and definition. That's the idea Paul has in mind when he writes to us about Jesus' ascension in Colossians chapter 3. He says that if we want to find some method to all the madness of life, we need to get the view from above. We need to follow Jesus into heaven and see things from his perspective in glory. The first two chapters of Paul's letter to the Colossian Christians are a great testimony to the reign and rule of King Jesus. Paul writes, For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether principalities or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. And if that's not enough, Paul goes on to say a little bit later, he's before all things and in him all things hold together. Jesus is not just the man, he is the God of us all. But you know what? Sometimes that's kind of hard to believe. I mean, you may all know this intellectually, but do you truly believe it when you look out at the world around you? That Christ is over all things? Is that what you say each morning after you read or turn on the news? Well, let's see, Jesus has everything under control today. I'll just go back to scrolling through Facebook. It's not what we say, is it? 
not if you read the news that I read. Sometimes just the opposite seems to be true. Well, I can't remember if it was high school or college that I had to read John Steinbeck's classic, The Grapes of Wrath. Tom Joad is the main character of this Pulitzer Prize winning book. Tom's grandpa homesteaded a farm out on the prairie. He broke the sod. He worked the land. He raised his family. And when he died, Tom's father took over. The land was good. God blessed his efforts. <coughs> and all was right in the world. But then the bad years came. The rain stayed up in the clouds. The grasshoppers ate their fill. The winds would batter the tender shoots of grain. And one by one, the farmers went bankrupt. First, they'd borrow a little money just to feed the family, but then they couldn't pay it back. And finally, the sheriff came out and told them all to get off the land. It wasn't theirs anymore. Well, whose land was it? Well, it belonged to the bank. So they went to the bank. I'm sorry, said the bank manager. I can't help you. You see, I only administer the bank. So they go to the board of directors. We're sorry, says the board of directors. We don't like to help you, but our hands are tied. The shareholders, you see, they're the ones who tell us what to do. And who are the shareholders? Well, there are a thousand faceless people all over the country. And Tom Joad's father wants to hit somebody. He wants to punch somebody in the face. But nobody's to blame. There's some monster that controls everything, and nobody can help it. Nobody knows what to do. Nobody seems to be able to fix it. And that's kind of where we live most of the time. And Paul knows that. At the beginning of chapter 2, he says life is a struggle even for him. He says he struggles to get people to see the mystery of God in Jesus Christ. He says people love to follow fine-sounding arguments and run after the latest fad or the wildest theories. He says they end up in a maze of life and they can't see the forest for the trees. They get caught up in what he calls hollow and deceptive philosophies. If you can't see how things fit together, if you don't have a perspective that's larger than yourself, that's where you end up. The world according to me. Or just as bad, the world according to someone else's selfish agenda. You would think Paul was writing to Americans in the year 2023, not Greeks and Turks in the year 60 A.D., there's a gravestone in an English cemetery that carries this epitaph. It says, Here lies a fellow who lived for himself and cared for nothing but gathering pelf. Now where he is or how he fares, nobody knows and nobody cares. Frightening, isn't it? To live in a little world with a small view of things. But that can change for you, says the Word of God. It can change when you get the view from above, the perspective on life that Jesus has, who has ascended to glory and sits next to the Father in heaven. It's a perspective that doesn't deny the evil that we see around us. It's a perspective that doesn't try to sugarcoat everything in some kind of syrupy sweet religion. Rather, it's a perspective that puts evil in its place and shows us the largest purpose for which we exist. That's what Paul says gaining the perspective of Christ can do for us. It can give us the perspective of Christ in heaven and then fill us with his character as we continue to live in this world. Paul says it begins with a confession of faith and then it continues with a conscious decision. The confession of faith is this, that Jesus Christ is Lord of all. That's step one. Now, it may not always seem like that's the case, but as Paul says in another passage, we live by faith, not by sight. And just because I don't see my family during the day doesn't mean they don't exist. Just because I don't understand electricity and how it works doesn't mean the lights won't come on when I flip the switch. Just because I can't see the wind doesn't mean I don't feel its power. That's the way it is with our testimony of faith. Even if God's ways are sometimes a mystery to me, when I turn on the news, it doesn't mean he's not there 
or that somehow he's lost control. There was a man and his little boy who were testing the springtime winds one time with a brand new kite. It was a big kite, colorful and fancy. They had a huge pull of string. The breezes were blowing stiff and the kite just wanted to run wild. And so they just kept letting out more and more string. And the kite went so high that the little boy couldn't even see it anymore. Is it still there, he asked. Oh yes, it's still there. How do you know for sure? I can't see it. Well, I know it's still there, said his dad, because I can feel it tugging at the string. That's how we make our testimony of faith. When we love somebody, even if we can't see him, we say he's tugging at our strings, at our heart strings, right? When we confess that Jesus is our Lord and Savior, we feel the tug of his love inside. Even though he's disappeared from sight for a while, we know he's alive. We know where he's at. We know what he's doing. And we know he's coming back again. That's the testimony we make with Paul in this week's text. And then comes that second part. The conscious decision about life. It's a choice just as basic as changing clothes every morning. Take off your old clothes, says Paul, and put on the new ones. Take off your short-sighted perspective, the way you naturally see things, and then put on the clothes of a new perspective, the big view of life from Christ's vantage point in heaven. Paul says in verses 9 and 10, Do not lie to each other, since you've taken off your old self with its practices and have put on a new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Well, what does that mean in practical terms? Well, the idea originally came from an ancient Greek philosopher named Pyro. Pyro was one of the first skeptics, and he honestly believed that the sensory world didn't even exist. He thought all that he saw around him was just a projection of his mind. And he told everybody that they shouldn't worry about a thing. Nothing actually existed anyway. Well, the townspeople got a kick out of that. One day they got the laugh of a lifetime. For here was Pyro, who said nothing really existed out there, running down the street being chased by a vicious dog. In a desperate move, he grabbed hold of a tree branch and swung himself up to safety. And the crowds gathered around and they called up to him. They said, hey, Pyro, why are you running from a dog that doesn't even exist? And Pyro shrugged his shoulders and told them, it's difficult to put off the old man. And ever since that day, philosophers talk about putting off the old man, the old self, the old perspective, and putting on a new way of life. That's what Paul's talking about here. If you believe Jesus is in charge, if you confess that he's Lord over creation, then live as if that's the case. Live as though it matters. Live as if his perspectives were your own. Stop being chased around by the dogs of anger and rage and malice, slander and even filthy language, he says. Instead, let the new you come alive. The new you that wears Christ's clothing of compassion and kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, and love. Put off the old self, the one of little perspectives and selfish motives. Put on the new self, the self that knows that Christ rules the world, the self that's transformed by his love. When Henry David Thoreau wrote his classic wilderness book, Walden, he told of a powerful custom among the local American Indian tribe. Once a year, they had a village cleanup called a busk. First, they would make new clothes for themselves and new furniture, new pots and pans, all the other necessities of life. And they would keep all of these new things in a new building just outside the village. And when everything was ready, they'd begin their annual spring cleaning. Every corner of every house was scrubbed. Every stick of furniture was thrown out. Every child's toy went on a big garbage heap. The dirt paths were swept. The weeds were plucked up. Even the food that was left over from the winter was thrown out the door, and all the trash gathered together, and they piled it high in the center of the village. 
Then the chief set the entire heap on fire. And while they were watching it burn, they took off their old clothes and threw them into the flames. They tended the fire carefully and made sure every last piece of trash was burned. They even waited for three days to make sure everything had been completely destroyed. No coals were still glowing. And then on the fourth morning, washed and bathed and dressed in their new clothes, they gathered again at the heart of the village. Now the chief started a new fire by rubbing some sticks together. And from the fresh flames, each family took a burning stick home. The old was gone. Life was beginning again. That's the kind of thing Paul's talking about here. If you believe that Christ rules in heaven, that he's given you a new life and a new perspective on things from his vantage point, then make a conscious decision to live that way. If you believe Jesus rules, then choose to act in ways that reflect his perspective and his love. Be kind, be patient, be generous and gracious, be hopeful, forgiving. These are the conscious choices we make when we have a living faith. This is the perspective of Christians who celebrate Jesus' ascension into glory. This is the lifestyle of those who have a new vantage point from which to view the world of God. So let's climb up high together. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray together. Holy and loving God, Lord, you sent your son to show us how to live. And then you raised him on the third day to sit beside you at your right hand, to have an eternal perspective of all things. Lord, help us to gain that perspective, the perspective of eternity, the perspective of love, for your creation, and for all people. Holy God, help us to put away our old ways and put on the new way, the way of Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Following Christ gives us a new perspective on life. New. That means putting away the old doing something different, putting away our old perspectives, our old selfish agendas, and taking on the perspective that Christ has and living as if that matters. So I pray that we together will grow toward the likeness of Christ and that we together will live knowing that Jesus is Lord of all. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.